Welcome to our leadership journey. We are Mike Cloutier and Peter Januszewski, and our goal is to interview people leaders at different stages of their career, from frontline managers to CEOs, and extract the leadership lessons they've learned on their journey to help you become a better leader. On this episode, we had the pleasure of chatting with Jim Hall. Jim Hall is the Senior Vice President and Canadian General Manager at Covis Pharmaceuticals, a global specialty pharmaceutical company. Over his 20-year career in the health sciences sector, Jim successfully led business unit reorganizations, established and reinforced organizational mission and direction, and revitalized and refocused new business development. Jim is a seasonal lecturer in the MBA program at the DeGroote School of Business. He was recently inducted into the Canadian Healthcare Marketing Hall of Fame, both for his contributions to the industry and his support and the development of others. In our discussion, we covered being proactive about building your network, keeping employees focused and engaged during turmoil, and being featured on TSN's Game of the Week. So uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're thrilled that some of you have returned, and we probably got some uh, new individuals tuning into our uh, podcast this evening. And we're absolutely thrilled to have Jim Hall joining us uh, this evening. Uh, I'm, I'm going to begin by telling a little bit of a story about how I met Jim, and then we'll get Jim to tell his version. And then ultimately, Jim can introduce himself and uh, give you an idea who he is. But Back in uh, the mid 80s, uh, I was a product manager working for a company called Searle. And back in the day, we had uh, one computer that we shared. It was in a room and there was a market research analyst by the name of David Quayle. So David and I uh, met in the, uh, in the room every once in a while, just basically to catch up on things and uh, socialize. But we happened to be in the room one day doing some work with the single computer that the company owned at the time. And and Jim came in and he was do he he needed to do some work on the computer so David and I kind of moved to the side and Jim went to town and and Jim was <laughs> Jim was doing things on the computer that David and I had never seen or could barely understand and uh, anyways he you know did his thing and then he got up and uh, said you know see you guys later and he left and 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 David and I turned to each other and almost simultaneously we said we're going to be working for that guy one day. <laughs> And uh, we knew very on that Jim had an uh, incredible amount of talent. It wasn't just about his computer skills, which were legendary. And I'll tell another story about that later on today. But uh, anyways, we, um, in all seriousness, we were just extremely in- impressed by Jim. He was an intern and uh, we could just tell that he was a person who was going to go places. And, and clearly he did. So, Jim, do you recall that? Uh, I don't recall that exact uh situation but i remember running into you guys many times including in the computer room and uh, i can be, remember being very intimidated and here i was a, a brand new intern wet behind the ears not knowing really what was up and what was down trying to find my way and, and here you two guys came in these polished uh pharmaceutical executive professionals and <laughs> i just didn't want to make a mistake and say anything stupid but obviously i made an impression uh, I kind of wish you guys maybe had told me that back then. Then I, you know, <laughs> we maybe could have skipped a few steps. <laughs> well, the, the truth is, Jim, that David and I were still trying to grow our careers. So the last thing we needed was some. Oh, well, I was competition. I yeah, we didn't want to compete with you as a uh, team. Yeah. Anyways, uh, thanks again for joining us. And t- Jim, just tell us a little bit about your uh, background. Yeah, so I have a, a MBA and a chemical engineering degree. So how I ended up as an analyst in a pharmaceutical company is a, is a whole other story, but. Thank God I did because, um, you know, I never did pursue an engineering career, but I did obviously pursue a pharmaceutical career. And, uh, you know, when I graduated from business school, you know, all I wanted to be was a product manager. That's, you know, it's all about marketing in business school. So sales is like, you know, a paragraph in the, in the marketing one-on-one book. Um, but early on, you know, it, you know, I got to know some people, my, you, Mike, and some others, Bob Gould and Tom and Tom Potter who became mentors of mine, all three of you, and uh, all of you to a person, you know, steer me into the sales rep role. You know, that if I wanted to have a career in pharmaceuticals, that's where I needed to really cut my teeth and, and get to know 
the business and the customers. And and I'll admit, I mean, it was uh, at first I, I thought, boy, you know, that's not really the track I was thinking I was going on, but um, that's what I ended up doing, and it was the best thing I ever did. I mean, I, I loved the job. I learned so much about the customer and what their needs were. Uh, I got a lot of exposure to other people in the company. Uh, and, and then so I went from there. I went to different marketing and sales leadership roles. And then <laughs> it's funny we're talking about this, Mike, because I, I tell this story a lot about when, uh, when I was uh, given the head of sales job at Searle, you know, a job that was previously occupied by an icon, Bob Gould, who, you know, he was like a god to me. The thought of me even doing the job he was doing was beyond comprehension. But anyways, I was encouraged by another guy, Tom Potter, which I may talk about later on in this discussion, to go for that job. And and um, all the interviews got done. Long story. I was a stiff competition. I didn't think there's any way I was going to get the job. Mike, you called me up and said, Jim, I need you to see me in my office first thing tomorrow morning. So, okay. I'm going in to be told that I'm not getting the job. And... Um, and yeah, and I went in there and we sat down. He reached across the table, shook my head hand, and said, "You're the new director of sales at Searle." And that that was um, I'll never forget that moment. The the only other moment like that that I remember is when I saw my name on the Western Mustangs roster when I made the team there. Uh-huh. Those two moments are emblazoned in my brain because yeah, that was a real watershed moment for me to get that kind of responsibility, accountability, leadership um, challenge. At that time, because as you'll recall, we were just about to launch Celebrex. And so, you know, one of the first things you told me was, okay, now you got to figure out how many sales reps you need to do that and go hire them. By the way, we're going to be partnering with a company called Pfizer and figure that out too. So it was a real interesting time of tremendous growth and change. And I just kind of felt like I was thrown into that. I had lots of support from, you know, the people that I mentioned and but I would say I learned a lot as a leader in that period of time. And then I went on, you know, we, we merged with some companies and were bought and sold. And I went into various, you know, different senior leadership roles. And I, I'd say for about 15 years, I was in a, you know, VP level commercial leadership role. And then about four years ago, I was given an opportunity to lead up a company in Canada called Aerolez, small private equity backed company, um, but with uh, operations in Canada. So it gave me an opportunity to have accountability for every function, you know, medical, regulatory, finance, HR, everything reported into me. Had to learn all of that really quick. And then that was a whole other new leadership challenge, you know, to actually go from a, a place of comfort where I, you know, I knew commercial, the commercial business inside and out of pharma and, and really knew, felt I knew how to lead in that environment to, having to understand and lead across the entire organization and uh, and more internationally as well. So that was a great challenge too. Uh, that company went through bankruptcy. So we, it went bankrupt in the U.S. Canada was a good profitable business. So we went through six months of receivership where I had a, a lawyer next to me. <laughs> and I had to run everything by him. Again, that was another inc- incredible leadership challenge because we wanted to keep that team intact because we were selling the Canadian business as part of the as part of the proceedings, which we ended up doing. But, you know, leading in that environment was, I'm going to say that's probably one of the biggest challenges because I knew I was leaving. You know, I wasn't going to hang around. I knew the business, cut the thing that we had built over two years was going away or changing ownership anyway. So it was tough to stay motivated and and uh, and to keep people, you know, focused and motivated as well. Uh, and, then, um, and then right after that, I went to a company called Covis. They had just decided they wanted to set up operations in Canada with two new products. I had gotten to know those people, and that's another one of my leadership insights we would get to around, you know, staying connected. Uh, but because of that, um, I got the job to head up Covis and start things in Canada, which was a another leadership challenge because, we, you know, I was the first employee and we had to build things from the ground up. Worked very collaboratively internally but also externally yeah. um so that's where i am now that's a long a long story i guess but uh been a great a great ride and uh, and i honestly can say you know it's i've had a great career i've, I've loved it but uh, you know it's it's i you know I, i've achieved if, if i've achieved anything of importance through the people that were around me and, and supported me and helped me get there uh you know what i've you know, what's different now is it's funny, you know, when you're young, you're that bright eyed 
guy or a gal that is looking up to others to guide you and lead you. And at some point, I don't know when it happens. For me, I think it was later than I should have realized. I was now that guy that people were looking mm. to. You know, that transition occurred and, and uh, it took me a little while to make it. Um, but now nah, that's part of the job and the leadership. Um, I guess part of leadership I like a lot is helping younger people and supporting them in their careers. Thank you. So, Jim, I, I've, I've written notes as you were speaking because you're right. There's a lot of gems in what you just said. So we'll, we'll hopefully dive into it. But since we have three pharma people on this call, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you because I, I did do a little bit of research. Obviously, you and I don't know each other prior to this call. So you've been teaching, teaching a course at uh, the Groot School of Business at McMaster University. And this is on pharma biotech business issues. And from my understanding, one of the objectives is to understand and discuss issues and challenges facing the Canadian pharma biotech industries. Can you maybe just from a broad perspective, talk to us about what some of those issues are in 2021? Well, I mean, I won't talk about the obvious one, which is that, you know, the impact of the pandemic, maybe we'll get to that. But um, that's, that's really one of the biggest challenges, I think. Another one, uh, I just had a conversation with someone today about this, about, you know, the, the uh, unrelated to the pandemic, but now connected is, you know, how are, you know, how are we going to deploy ourselves in the future? How are we going to bring value to customers, interact with customers in a way that supports them, but also grows our business in an environment that's becoming more regulated, more challenging, uh, where, you know, becoming more global. That's been happening for a while now, but, you know, Canadian affiliates are under tighter and tighter restrictions and, and greater scrutiny from global counterparts. So how do we operate within that environment? Um, I think that's going to be a challenge. I think our reputation as an industry is a big one that, you know, we've been grappling with for a long time that has an impact. I, you know, I, I would like to think that the, some of the delays in the PMPRB guidelines is a, is a sign that our voice may be being heard a bit more than the past, but I would hope that, you know, the miracle that of vaccines that everybody has experienced and witnessed is, you know, going to be seen in the right light, you know, that it truly is a medical miracle that wouldn't have happened without all the great people in the pharmaceutical industry. So um, I think reputation is a, is a big one. Um, finding good talent as we go forward will be another, you know, um, because of the way things that are changing, you know, some people are going to be left behind probably and then there's going to be new talent emerging that is going to be required that's different so leaders recognizing that and, and working with that that transition effectively i think is going to be um important as well um yeah i think those would be the big ones for me one of the things you mentioned earlier was the staying connected i think was the phrase you used and i think you sort of dove yeah. into it a little bit here so Maybe yeah. talk to um, the importance of that. I mean, th I think you mentioned a little bit just now, but talk to talk to us a little bit more about the importance of staying connected throughout your your career journey, and certainly as as you're starting to lead uh, teams. So it was it, Mike knows this story part, the good parts of it, anyways. And that's um, when we were pharmacia, we were being bought by Pfizer, and we we knew for about six to eight months before they took over that we were being bought, and I was the um, he was a VP of sales at that time at Pharmacia. And I'd been doing that job or versions of it or everything I told you previously for, you know, since 1989, basically, when I started as an analyst. And really was very internally focused. I hadn't, you know, hadn't really worked on my external network at all to any great extent. Certainly not proactively, maybe in a passive way. But I remember sitting at my desk going, holy crap, you know, I, I'm going to be out of a job in six months and I don't even know where to begin to look for a new one. Like I, it was scary. Like, and you know, the worst thoughts go through your head. Well, you know, there's, you know, if I want to do the, a similar job, there's no, they're not just, you know, out there growing on trees. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm never going to find a job like I have now. I'm going to start over and, you know, um, and so I, you know, I talked to a lot of people and, um, and again, I talked to this industrial psychologist. I was, mentioning Dr. Minden and I said I told him what was going on. I said, what have you been doing? I said, well, I've been calling, you know, people I know. Well, who's that? Well, I told him, oh, those people are all in the same job you're in at pharmacy, aren't they? I said, yeah, we, they're not going to help you out. I mean, they're going to see his competition. Why are you calling them? I said, well, I don't know. There are people I know. That's the easy thing to do. He said, well, this isn't going to be easy. You know, you have to work. He said, and uh, his advice was, 
you know, make a list of all the companies you want to work for. Find out who the CEOs are of those companies. And, and Mike helped me with that list. In fact, Mike, you, you helped me connect with Ronnie Miller. Yep. Because you knew him. Um, and then I made it, and then I just called them, just cold called them in the morning, you know, before their day got started. I, I think there was about 10 of them and I, and eight of them agreed to meet with me. I mean, incredibly generous. Some of them I'd never spoken to before ever. And I just said, look at, you know, I'm, this is my, who I am. I'm not looking for a job right now, but this is what's going on with the company. I'd love just to connect and get to know you and learn about your business. And, um, so I met with a guy named Jerry McDowell, who, you know, he's, he was a icon back in the day uh, who headed up AstraZeneca and um, had a great meeting with him. He brought in some of the senior leaders and, hey, you got to meet this guy, Jim Hall, blah, blah, blah. And that was fine. And then I also met with Ronnie Miller uh, and um, great meeting with him, too. Um, and so but there were no jobs. But in any event, um, and then it was, you know, I met with probably another, like I said, eight in total. Um, but the next job I got was at AstraZeneca when I left Pharmacia. And I'm convinced that at least me having met Jerry and his senior leadership team greased the skids for me to get that job. You know, when there was a person in that company that I knew, they said, hey, there's this role. Are you interested? I said, sure. And I, I'm pretty certain he must have spoken to uh, Jerry. And Jerry would have said, hopefully, well, you know, he seemed like an ambitious kind of um, guy with initiative, uh, I would support it. So, you know, I think that really made a difference there. You know, I, I tell, I retell that story quite a bit to people that are looking for work that are in the same boat that aren't really networked and, and hoping that maybe, you know, that inspires them or, you know, they don't do the exact same thing, but maybe a similar approach. Um, but, you know, the, I, the, the concept there is that you got to take the initiative. You got, you can't be going there with, you know, your arms out looking for something you're just going out to meet people and um and you got to reach out to the people that are relevant to that task you have at hand at that point in time the other thing i always tell young people is uh, related to what you were talking about mike is i can remember several times in my career when you or tom or somebody came to me and said jim do you want to do this uh one example was i i i had just been a sales rep for six months and tom asked me to at a national sales meeting in front of all the sales reps in the company tell them what my secrets to success were for selling <laughs> and it was it was uh, like i don't know there's a 50 reps at that time i think and and you know these some of these reps were were stars you know they were incredible so uh, but you know what he encouraged me to do it so i did it and i'm glad i, I did you know i i'm sure a lot of people were going what does he know under their breath but for me it was the development that i received as a result of that the courage knowing that i could do that and get through it do a reasonably good job really went a long way so i, I always say to people you know seize every opportunity everything that's given to you by somebody whether it's somebody within your company or out just go for it you know don't be yeah. worried about it you know what's the worst that can happen you can yeah. fall on your face and learn something about yourself so Jim, as the the second part of my really long-winded question was when you're when you want to connect with people, right? So at the VP level, for you to cold call some CEOs makes perfect sense. Now, yeah. if you're entry level employee, what advice would you give to them? Because I presume it's not call the CEOs of companies you want to work at. Yeah, well, I I, I don't have the first hand experience, right? Because as I said, I I got a job at Searle and I stayed there for 15 years and just had my head down, but. Um, I would think it's analogous, right? So if I'm a, if I want to be a sales rep, I'm going to track down some sales managers, whoever the hiring manager is. Actually, now that I think of it, um, even within Searle, and I, I give this advice to people as well, um, you got to manage your own career. You know, you got to make sure the people who are in the position of decision making know what your career aspirations are. So that means you got to think about it first. You got to go, okay, what do I want to be doing in a year or five years from now? How do I get there? And then you need to let people know that so that, you know, when, when Mike decides he wants to hire a sales manager and I walk into his office, he says to me, I've been expecting you versus what the heck are you doing here? I didn't know you were interested in that role. So I think if you, you know, if you're thinking about, yeah, VP to GM, that's pretty senior, 
but it's the same thing. You know, you're making sure those that are in the positions of decision making and can have an influence on whether or not you, you'll get a job or be promoted or hired know you and and know about you and and what your what your uh, aspirations are. And the other thing internally is it may have an external effect too though. I don't, and again, this is advice I give to every new person, including Flavia, my intern, is you know obviously doing a good job is table stakes. Everybody's going to, you know, lots of people are doing good jobs. You're not going to differentiate yourself or stand out by doing a good job only. You need to go above and beyond. You need to walk into your boss's office and say, you know, when I was working this, I came across this. What do you think? It's, you know, I did this analysis and I think it means this, you know, so don't wait to be asked to do stuff. Take the initiative and you'll stand out, right? So when you do pursue that job, uh, people are, you already have a reputation, regardless of the level of you are in the organization. You know, as somebody who has initiative that gets stuff done, that's smart, um, and uh, someone you'd, you'd want to have in your team. So that's, you know, that's the other piece of it. It's not just having coffee with, with the, the boss. You got, you got to stand out. You got, it's like it's marketing yourself, basically. Mm -hmm. So, Jim, you've mentioned a lot of sort of leadership insights, leadership things that you've learned and the way you've sort of come to where you are today. So now at this point in your career journey, how do you see yourself? How would you like to be remembered by the people that have been on your teams as a leader? Yeah, I think I mentioned a little bit. I like to hopefully people see me as some with, someone with humility, you know, that um, it's, a, it's an interesting balance because I'm a very competitive person. I like to win. And... I don't mind being a little aggressive on the playing field, you know, if it's needed, if that's part of the game. Um, but you can be competitive and be edgy and and want to win, but still be a decent human being and, and have humility and be genuine, you know. And so that's how I'd like to be remembered as someone who really competed to win, that, that was successful, that helped other people win and compete, compete well. But was a genuine person, you know, that, you know, what you saw is what you got, that was honest, had integrity. Um, those are the, and then, and honestly, and this is something I've always stood for, is that, you know, that there's more to life than work, you know, that family is the most important thing. Uh, your kids and your spouse or whatever it is, you, you know, that's important to you. You got to prioritize that. So, uh, I've been thankfully I've been able to do that my entire career, and um, you know I hope that that that's how people would remember me as a leader. You know, somebody that stood for that and helped others do the same. You know, it's interesting what's going on with COVID because you know even a month ago our perspective of COVID, or at least my perspective of COVID, has changed. So now I'm thinking about. So we're coming out of this. Like you can feel it happening. We know that we're moving forward and there's going to be, you know, what people are calling the next normal. But I think what's important is to reflect on what have we learned in the process that we can bring forward? What, is, what are we going to carry forward? So Jim, that would be my question to you is what have you learned and experienced that you think is going to help in the future? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I'll maybe finish with the more obvious stuff, like, you know, how we go to market. But I, I would say the biggest learning for me is, like, this is an event that none of us have experienced before. I, mean, I could have told you before COVID what our sales were going to be to $20,000. Like, I knew. Like, I could tell. I could tell from how the market was responding, what we were doing, from the data. That all went out the window with COVID. Suddenly, you know, things are all over the place. So it was, I mean, that's just an observation. That, that happened and that is an experience that, that will help in future times of turbulence or, you know, unexpected events. It doesn't have to be that magnitude, but managing that turbulence. But really the biggest thing for me was managing expectations. So, you know, going into COVID, I kind of kept operating like I knew the business was going to come in the way it always came in. And, you know, in retrospect, obviously, that was foolish. And it was pretty clear that it wasn't going to happen pretty quickly, you know, by April or May. Um, 
um, and then manage your expectations throughout the entire time, including now, because now, you know, everybody's saying, okay, everything's back to normal. You know, great. We're going to, you know, things are going to get back to where they were and yada, yada. So, you know, we, we can't just um, glibly say that because I don't think that's going to be the case. Right. You know, you know, we are, I think there's been a, uh, you know, a real sort of seismic shift to the way the market is going to behave going forward. There's been disruption that is probably, not probably, will have even affected how people prescribe and how patients take medications. So we have to understand that and manage the expectations around that within our own companies, with our teams, and with senior leadership as well. Yeah, I think that I love your insights on the marketplace. I think that's bang on. What, what about internally? Talk a little bit about sort of how things have been evolving over the last 18 months and where you're heading. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, as you know, I mean, pharma is still, we, we promote and grow our products primarily through Salesforce. Companies are experimenting with different, different approaches, have been before the pandemic, and it's been changing and evolving. But I still believe the most effective way to, in most markets to influence prescribing is through one face-to-face -face sales calls. And so for a period of time, that was taken away, and we learned from that. Um, but keeping people motivated and focused was a big challenge internally. Mm -hmm. So you have salespeople who are, you know, we spend a lot of time hiring the best, developing them. They're all doing great. And this happens, and they're sitting at home. Well, they didn't. They didn't sign up to sit in front of a computer talking to physicians. That you know, they're they're effective and they enjoy their jobs by being out in the street in front of people. So keeping them supported, motivated, letting them know that we we empathize with what they're doing. So that was a big learning for me as a leader was to being more empathetic. You know, remembering to say on the conference calls, "So how's everybody doing? Everybody okay?" You know, I I didn't really do a lot of that before COVID. Um, I you know that's if we're gonna say a uh, weakness that I have. It's really, I'm not a super touchy feely guy that way, but, um, you know, keeping people focused, motivated, not thinking they're going to lose their jobs, that we're going to shut down because they, they started seeing that with other companies downsizing, um, you know, and, um, and then sort of finding ways to help them be, continue to be successful that, that didn't involve face-to-face -face calls. And every company went through that, right? And, and uh, it caused this industry really through necessity to look for ways to promote other than face-to-face -face calls because we've been dabbling in it for years, right, Mike? I mean, mm -hmm. never really got taken up. Um, but now it's been taken up big time. And there's all kinds of things that are going to change now as a result of that, in my opinion, um, which we can talk about if you like. But uh, I'd say internally it was, it was that. It was... Um, it was a lot of, you know, me managing um, my boss and others, you know, in other parts of the company, wondering, you know, what's going on, what's happening, you know, really providing information and 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 rationale for what's what what's happening to the business um, that was new and different. So that was that was uh, critical. And then I guess hiring, you know, hiring in this environment has been different too. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you do interviews? Well. I mean, we we have people in our company that I've never met face to face. We have po people in our salespeople that the head of sales has never met face to face. Uh, so that affects things. And then you know, team dynamics. We're we're right now embarking on a uh, an initiative locally and globally around teaming. Like, what? How does this? How are we going to be teaming coming out of this? And what do we need to do? We're a growing company, so we have a lot of people that came on board during this pandemic. And so, how do you? reorient them? How do you reintegrate them? Um, so those are all questions I think that need to be asked that we're, we're exploring right now. Mm. Terrific. Terrific. Yeah. Wonder, wonderful insight. So you, you mentioned a number of, of sort of dials you've had to turn up the empathy, the communication. It sounds like you've had to sort of have to yeah. ramp those, those activities up. Yep. Jim, any, anything to get to back off of? You, you mentioned com competitiveness. Was this a time where you had to sort of Pull back yeah. a little bit. Well, that's a really, a really good question, and that's it was a learning for me because, uh, it, you know, as as a leader, that is, it, and as I said, I, you know, I'm a competitive person, and uh, I love seeing good results, 
you know, I love looking at graphs where things are going like this, the market share is going like this. And I love to congratulate and reinforce that when that happens. And so, you know, when things were going like this, because the market was all over the place, I was still kind of drilling in with my team. Okay, why, why is this happening? Why aren't we going? Why is the share plateauing? And I was probably being a little, putting a little too much pressure on some people, um, which in retrospect wasn't really helpful. You know, I probably should have been a little more like the pilot in the plane, right? We're experiencing a little turbulence, nothing to worry about. Put your seatbelts on, everything's going to be fine versus what's going on? What, you know, why, why, why is the plane going up and down? How do we get this thing leveled out? <laughs> those are not flights I enjoy where the pilot no, comes are, on and says, want to be on what's going flights? on? <laughs> not, a, not my least favorite flight. Yeah. That when the pilot <laughs> says, what's going on, it's time to look for a parachute and a door. Uh, but so anyways, you know, that was learning for me as a leader that it, required a bit of a different approach from what I had been applying, you know, because I, I felt like I had really struck this balance between support, um, recognition, and, you know, but task tension, you know, keeping it. And I think I should have dialed back the task tension a bit just because everybody's so stressed out and there was no reason to believe anybody wasn't doing everything they could and under the circumstances to, to do what needed to be done. So, yeah, that's that was my uh, learning for me. So, Jim, uh, I, I think, like myself, I mean, I, I was blessed with a number of great uh, mentors and coaches and people who really um, were there for me when I needed, you know, someone to assist me and to be a part of my growth and development. Uh, who, who are the people who are important to you? Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of people like you, Mike, that have, that have supported me and have inspired me. And, and I... But I'm going to pick three that really stand out. We've already mentioned one of them, Tom Potter, who, you know, one of the best mentors and and just people, best people you'll ever meet. But he, um, you know, I learned a lot just from his leadership style, obviously, and how he how he led and and carried himself and communicated. But he was the kind of guy that made you, you know, believe you could do more than you thought you could do yourself. You know, he would push you in the right direction at the right time. And and so that was something I he really inspired me with, and I tried to take away and do with others. He also said something to me that I'll never forget, and I tell people all the time because it comes up surprisingly frequently, and it's about accountability. So I remember uh, it was when I was a sales manager, mid '90s, and Tom was my boss, and we were being asked to do something by his by Global or by someone in Chicago or something. I was bitching about, oh, well, we can't do that. You know, it's going to really demotivate the field. And, and, and Tom goes, well, you know, that's that's what we need to do. So we got to find a way to do it. So well, let's just let's just tell the reps that that we were told we had to do this. You know, that that we got we got told by the manage, senior management in Chicago we had to do this. He looked at me, stopped. He looked at me. He goes, Jim, the moment you say something like that is the moment you start to devalue yourself as a leader and undermine your leadership. He said, if as soon as people think that you are not accountable for whatever decisions you have to make, they no longer look at you as their leader. And I'll never forget that day and that moment. And I've stood, tried to st stand by that. It's tough sometimes because there's little times, you know, where, you know, you don't agree at all with something. Um, but I will never say to anybody I lead that somebody else is making us do this. It's my decision. This is why. Um, and uh, and, and I, I have to give that advice a lot to people because it comes up a lot. Um, another person Mike knows is John Savoy. John Savoy to me is the best motivator of people that I have ever known. And uh, he works at AZ right now, but I had the pleasure of leading him when he was a sales manager. And I, I never saw a sales team more dedicated and committed to performing for him than I ever saw and ever have seen since. I don't know what it is about him. I think it's his style, his genuine nature, the way he communicates, but he's been an inspiration to me in terms of motivating people. And then finally, my father would be the, the third person because he, he, he showed me how to, how to have a, a, a balanced life, how to 
focus on the family and really be present for what's important. So That's those would be the three. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant, Jim. Well said. Great people. I think we've reached that magical moment where we get to the lightning round, which is so exciting, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Hold on to your seat. Is there money at, at stake here? Or what's the... the, there is no money. Nothing. Is zero. zero. Yeah. Okay. But, so uh, would but you, you like can me... win. All right. Well, hey, I got that going for me. <laughs> Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, so number one in a rapid fire question, Jim. So, uh -huh. if someone wrote a biography of your professional journey to date, what would be the title? Oh, the unexpected leader. Ooh, ooh. nice. Because yeah. I honestly never expected. I, I honestly, when I when I started my career, I thought if I ever got to be a sales manager, I would have made it. And I honestly believe that even when I became a sales manager, because it was the best job in the world. And so I, you know, it wasn't until maybe I got into that role and got exposed to some really cool, interesting leadership concepts and the broad organization and then mentors that really, you know, supported me that I started thinking, wow, you know, I think I could be a, a more broader, more senior leader. And it's something I'd really want to do. So. I, I call the unexpected leader as a provocative title to get people to read and then they'd hear my story. Jim, if, if someone took this book, so let's say this uh, biography was written, someone took this, they, they bought the rights to it and they're going to make a movie. Who would, who would star as the, in the lead role? Well, that would have to be Tom Cruise because <clears throat> we're both really good looking and athletic. Perfect. And also, he and I went to the same school in Ottawa. So yeah. we have that connection. There we go. Brilliant. <laughs> Okay. And, and, and Jim has been known to jump on furniture. Yeah, I have. <laughs> and, and pharma is a risky business. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good. Okay. Uh, number two, if you were going to write a theme song or an anthem for leadership, what would be the chorus line that would be repeated throughout the song? Like, like a message that you think leaders <clears throat> should, should, should uh, really keep in mind. So I'm not very musical. So is a chorus like the same repeated thing that goes yes. to the song? Okay. Yes, it's the middle part, that really catchy part that people keep, keep right. repeating. Uh, you gotta be you. You gotta be you. That'd be it. Nice. Back to that genuine, authentic yep. thing. Yeah, gotta really. be you. Okay. And so you, you've talked a lot about um, mentoring people, helping people develop. So in terms of the people that, that you've helped along the way, what have been some of the books that you've gifted the most to, like new employees, new people on your team that you think yeah. would benefit them from a professional perspective? Yeah. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest and say I'm not a big book gifter. Uh, um, I, well, I should back that up. Lately, I have been, but because I'm doing a lot more reading now, but Early on, there was a book that really had an influence on me. Um, I think I mentioned I was on this sort of self-imposed leadership training journey program. And, and one of the books I read there was one called uh, Bringing Out the Best in People by Aubrey Brown. It was all about positive reinforcement and, you know, kind of the one-minute manager, but a, a little broader. But that finding, you know, catching people doing things right concept. So, um, I, so... I would give that book to people that wanted to become managers or were in the, in the beginning of their journey to being managers uh, because of that, I had a lot of great insights. Awesome. Brilliant. So uh, final question for you, uh, Jim, if you don't mind, I would love to, you mentioned uh, the Mustangs. Now I did my undergrad at UWO, so we have that ah, in common. We have that in common. Yeah. So I, I, I did you, were you part of the Mustangs? Were you a, were you a member of the team? Yeah, I was a water boy, and I would give the all the players hey, feet hey. massages when they got off. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. I, I did play. I played. Um, you know, I wasn't the, the star of the team, but I I had three good years there. And you can probably Google. A, there's a YouTube video of me scoring two goals on TSN Game of the Week. Really? Yeah, and oh, I was interviewed fantastic. at the end of the game. So that's my claim yeah. to fame. So Jim and. Because you mentioned that you're open to people reaching out to you if you when they want to connect with you. Um, and since if someone listens to this, maybe they'd like to follow up and maybe see what you're up to. Where can people find you, Jim? What's the, what's the best way for people to, to connect with yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, I think LinkedIn's now the best, right? Because if, if they just send me a message there, 
I'll just reply with a phone number or an email and then we can go from there. Perfect. So LinkedIn and on LinkedIn, I believe you're James Hall. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm, I think so. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Maybe I better change that to Jim. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> Jim, thanks so much for doing this. It was a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, You've shared really some really it. wonderful insights. Thanks All so right. much, Jim. Signing right. out. Thanks again, Jimmy. Really Bye. appreciate it.